So it's a great pleasure to be here, and since everyone is talking about uh, whether it's their first, second, third time, I, I can't even remember how many times I've been at MLConf. Is it, is it third, fourth? Uh, but it's a conference that I like a lot, and uh, I think uh, made good friends and, and had good discussions here. And uh, about a year ago uh, in San Francisco, actually, I had this presentation that was 10 lessons learned from building machine learning systems. And it, was, it became kind of like pretty popular. Uh, when you give a talk like this, you never know. Like some of the things might seem obvious to the person giving them. So like, I don't even know if th those things are going to be interesting. But the feedback that I got was that it was super interesting and there was a lot of chatter around them. So this time around, and given that I've changed companies, so I was at Netflix before um, leading the algorithms team, and now I'm at Quora, I said, I'm going to just revisit those lessons. And as a matter of fact, they're completely different. They're unrelated to the 10 initial lessons that I talked about last year. And um, I hope you enjoy them. You will find some obvious, some interesting, and some even very controversial, probably. And I'll be happy to talk about all of them after my talk. So first, though, let me make a quick introduction about machine learning at Quora. Um, I've talked se uh, several times about this, and I didn't want to bore the audience with, again, giving the same presentation. If you go to the MLConf in Seattle, there is a video where I talk about this for about 40 minutes. I'm just going to do a very quick overview. Um, how many of you, let me start with that, how many of you are Quora users in the audience? Okay, so good, probably more than half, so I don't need to tell you uh, much about Quora, but Quora is basically a knowledge site. Uh, we structure our knowledge around the paradigm of questions and answers, but that's just a paradigm that we use as an excuse to basically get knowledge that is in people's head or in the world, but it's not in the internet yet. And our mission is therefore to grow and share the world's knowledge, but I think those two things are very important. We are not in the business of only sharing it because some of it, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, we also want to grow it. And we have millions of answers, millions of users, millions of questions. And what that, um, sorry, uh, what we care about uh, is three different dimensions. And those three different dimensions that we care about, I think, are pretty unique and come into play into the data we use and also in how we optimize the algorithms. So the three things we care about, one of them is relevance, and that's pretty obvious. Everyone cares about relevance. Everyone wants to put the right advertising in front of you, so you click on it. But the problem with relevance is if you optimize only for CTR, you can fall into sort of like different traps, and you are going to, only going to be optimizing for that, getting that next click. Um, now, if you combine relevance with quality, you end up going into very different uh, world where now it's not only about getting that extra click, it's also about wondering is that thing that the person clicked on a good quality or not? And you need to tune your algorithms and your data to also understand what quality actually means. I'll be talking a little bit about that in some of the lessons learned. And finally, we also care about demand as a whole. Uh, we care about demand because knowledge, you know, there's a long tail of knowledge, of course, and we care about that, but we also care about understanding what is it that most people want to know about. And that's what we sort of like describe as demand. So what kind of data do we use? Um, and it's a pretty complex ecosystem. It's kind of a combination of, you could see it as a knowledge base plus a topical network on top of it, plus a social network on top of it, because we have, first of all, we have users as everyone, but users are sort of like a pretty, um, important part of the data um, ecosystem itself. We have users that define a social network. Users can follow users, but not only follow users, they can actually also endorse users in a given topic. And users, of course, are the ones that are generating questions and answers. They're also upvoting, downvoting answers. So all of that together with, again, the topic ontology and the topic network that we have defines sort of like this complex ecosystem of data that we feed into many of our algorithms. So here's a list of applications. Again, I'm not going to go into them. I will mention some of them in some of the lessons. Uh, we do answer ranking, feed ranking, uh, topic recommendations, user recommendations, email digest. That's one that I get a lot of compliments on. Uh, people love their Quora emails. Um, ask to answer, 
duplicate questions, related questions, spam, moderation, classifiers, trending now, all of that, all of those algorithms are driven by machine learning approaches that are being fed with the data and the data relations that I, I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, and of course, you can read about it more uh, if you go to the Quora product itself, there's a blog post and there's a, a Quora question and answer of how do we use machine learning where I go into some details on how do we uh, solve some of these questions. Okay, so what about models? What do we use? So here's a mm, not uh, complete but pretty comprehensive list of models that we have right now uh, somewhere in production solving some of these issues. So from logistic regression, elastic nets, which were mentioned before when studying the brain, um, gradient-boosted decision trees, random forest, deep neural networks, uh, learning to rank approaches like Lambda Mart, matrix factorization, LDA, and other unsupervised approaches. So um, I don't put this slide here to brag about how many models we know and how many different things we do. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we could use only one, we would. Uh, we use different models because sometimes, for whatever reason, some models work better than others. And even th some that should be pretty similar, like random forest and gradient boosted decision trees, turns out that for some particular applications, one works better than the other. So that's why we have the different models. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna dive into the 10 lessons learned now, and I'm gonna be using examples from other places, but also examples from Quora. So I thought it would be interesting to introduce uh, at least what we're doing and what kind of models we're uh, implementing. Okay, so the first one is about implicit versus explicit signals, and implicit signals beat explicit ones almost always. That's uh, the first lesson. So many uh, different companies have acknowledged that implicit feedback is more useful. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was in Netflix, Justin and me wrote about um, beyond the five stars and what we were doing in order to sort of like come up with different algorithms and use different signals that were not the typical five star rating that Netflix used in the Netflix price competition. Uh, YouTube also talked um, some time ago about how their five stars didn't really work and actually went to a thumbs up, thumbs down, which is still explicit, but it's a uh, less complicated um, way to get some feedback. So is it true that uh, implicit feedback is always more useful? And if that's the case, uh, why and what, what can we do about it? So um, I would say the answer is yes, implicit feedback is usually more useful. and the main reason for that is because we have more of it. We have more of it and it's less sparse. So therefore, it better represents the problem domain and it's a better training data set than the explicit one. Uh, among other things, you're, gonna, um, you, you're not gonna have the data set dominated by your power users, for example. You're gonna be able to get some signals from new users as soon as possible as they start interacting with your site and so on and so forth. There are other reasons also. Um, one of them is it better reflects um, what the user behavior is, and you usually care more about user behavior than really user reflection. And reflection, I mean, what do they think they should be telling the system or how do they think they should be representing themselves by giving you a signal? Um, it's also, therefore, more related to your final objective function that you're trying to optimize for, and it usually tends to be more better correlated with A-B test results, right? So. As an example, I don't know if you can see this, but if you go to IMDb and you look at the top U.S. grossing um, films in 2014 and you compare it with the most highly rated, um, if I had to recommend things to watch for this audience right now, I would probably go with the first one, which is like what did people actually end up going and watching rather than what's highly rated. Uh, there are some caveats to that, there's, but the main one is like there's a lot more data about people that actually went and watched things than there is about who people rated and what the average rating became, right? As a matter of fact, the second list, if you go to it, it's gonna be dominated by films that get very few ratings, but they're all very high. Okay, however, there's a caveat to all of this, and one of them is um, direct implicit feedback might not always correlate with what you want to optimize, which is long-term retention. It does correlate very well with what people do, but it 
not necessarily what people do in the short term is what you want them to do in the long term, or it doesn't even correlate to whether they're going to stay with you more than that session, right? Um, so I think a typical and clear example of that is clickbait. If you feed clickbait into your product, whatever it is, and you put some shiny images, like the one that Alex showed of the woman in the bikini, you're going to get a bunch of clicks on that. But that doesn't mean that your users are going to come back next week and keep using your site. As a matter of fact, it might, be, it might go very well go the other way around. So um, what can you do about it? So I guess one of the things that you can do about it is combine the you know, readily available and huge data set that you will have from your clicks and your implicit feedback with also explicit feedback, then it's going to give you sort of like a different flavor of what users are doing and optimize for a combination of both things. So right here uh, on, the, on the right, uh, you have sort of like how does the answer in Quora's feed look, looks like. And there are many places where a user can click. The user can click on the question. The user can upload and download. And of course, um, and the user, sorry, the user can expand, which is, oops, basically can go into reading the full answer. So there's going to be different flavor to each one of those signals. And some of them, you're going to get many more of them. Uh, so if you, a user really wants to read the question, they need to span. You'll get less of other things that are, for example, sharing on Twitter or Facebook is going to be more unique. And people are not going to do it that often. But there's still going to be value in combining those things in a way that you can optimize for a combination of them. And I'll talk about how you do that in one of the next lessons. So let me move on. And this is very related. Your model will learn only what you teach it to learn. Um, so what, what is it that you're showing the model? And what is it that your model is going to learn to? So there's basically three things, right? Training data. And that's where your implicit, explicit data comes into play. There's a target function. For example, what's the probability of this user reading an answer or um, answering a question? That could be another target function. And then there's your, your metric. And for example, there's the traditional trade-off between precision and recall. But you could have um, another ranking metric or whatever you're optimizing for. So let me make up sort of an example which I have here. I could decide to optimize, and going back to the example of going to the cinema or not, I could optimize the probability of a user going to the cinema to watch a movie and rate it highly by using purchase history and previous ratings. Right? So here, I am combining both implicit and explicit data. The user, did, did the user go? Did the user rate it highly? And I could also use as the metric the NDCG of the final ranking, and maybe only not only use the NDCG of the final ranking, what the user clicked on, but also impose a condition of I'm only going to count as positive things that the user clicked on and then rated for uh, higher, right? So I can introduce, again, implicit, explicit feedback, not only on the training data, but also in the way that I'm evaluating the metric and I'm optimizing my model too. Um, another example, let's go to uh, something closer to home, chorus feed. So in chorus feed, as I said, we are going to have implicit and explicit feedback. Uh, we are mixing all of that in our training data. So we're going to get clicks. We're going to get upvote. We're going to get downvote. We're going to get expands. We're going to get shares. We're going to use all of that. And then our target function, which is the value of showing a story to the user, is going to be a weighted sum of actions. So we're going to be giving a weight to how much we think and obviously, we think and we have measure through A-B test. Some of those actions correlate to the long-term objective of making users happy, right? And is it more valuable that we get a click? Is it more valuable that we get a share or upvote? Uh, a downvote is a negative action, but how much should we weight it in sort of like the target um, function that we're optimizing for? Um, we can then predict the probability for each of those actions and then compute the predicted Mm, value of showing a story to a user as the expected value of summing those weighted actions uh, at the end. And that's actually how many people do these kinds of things, is by basically inputting different actions and optimizing for the weighted sum of those actions actually happening. And then the metric, uh, because the feed is basically 
uh, ranked list. You can use any ranking. Well, not any. You should look into it and see which one correlates better to your A-B test, but you can use a ranking metric. Okay, number three, supervised and unsupervised learning. So there's um, this sort of like pattern that you see when you've seen many of these systems in production in many different places, which I think it's interesting, and I don't see people talk about it very often. So unsupervised learning, you can think of it in many different ways. The, the uh, traditional definition like, well, you don't have labels, sure. But what can you use unsupervised uh, learning for? So you can use it as dimensionality reduction, right? And that's, I think, very important. It's like you have highly dimensional space. You want to collapse it into something that then you can use differently as features or whatever it is, but you're, you're reducing the dimensionality, and you might be reducing the sparsity at the same time. Um, and it's also a way to do actually feature engineering, right? Because when you have sort of like this high dimensional space of things like clicks on users on ads, and you want to reduce it to something that you can use as a feature to a classifier, well, unsupervised learning can come in very handy. Um, so the interesting thing is combining unsupervised and supervised learning leads into this pattern that I mentioned before that I think it's very interesting and it's all over the place and not m many times uh, highlighted. Um, one example from the old days of sort of collaborative filtering is uh, nearest neighbors was something that everyone was using for collaborative filtering before matrix factorization came in. But what many people were doing also is doing some form of unsupervised uh, learning before. So for example, in this particular paper, they were using uh, k-means as a clustering pre-processing going into the nearest neighbors. And you can do uh, other things like LSH and so on, which is doing both things at the same time in, in some sense. And actually, that's also my point. It's things like matrix factorization, which of course people will say, well, you have targeted labels, so it's supervised. Well, kind of it is, or it could not be. It depends on what you do with the output of your model. Uh, you could use matrix factorization to sort of find user and item factors, and then forget about the prediction of the uh, final label. You could use those factors as input to another model when, and then in that, in that case, you're really doing unsupervised because you're not really uh, predicting any label. You're just collapsing the dimensionality of your space. Um, as a matter of fact, um, some of you might know that non-negative matrix factorization is a pretty decent clustering algorithm, uh, so it's used for basically unsupervised clustering. Um, not only that, um, deep learning, and I think many people don't talk about it um, this way either, is also one of the tricks, one of the many tricks of uh, deep learning is that it you can combine unsupervised and supervised learning in the same framework, doing the exact same thing, basically collapsing your dimensionality, uh, learning feature representations, and then predicting the labels, right? And there's different examples how you can do that, like using uh, autoencoders is one of them, and using unsupervised plus supervised training, or unsupervised pre-training, and, and then training for convolutional nets. Um, as, as a matter of fact, this picture here, sorry. Um, this picture here on the right uh, is from Jan Le Kuhn. He presented a couple uh, weeks ago where he's putting sort of like the different deep learning methods. I'm not sure you can see it here clearly, but I uh, will polish the slides on how unsupervised and how supervised they are and how deep or shallow they are. Uh, but there's some that are somewhere in between. They're neither supervised and supervised. They're somewhere in between, and you can actually do both unsupervised pre-training and then supervised training. So again, combining these two things is usually very important for many of these systems. Number four, everything is an ensemble. So when we have talked, I include myself, lessons learned from the Netflix prize, we've talked about matrix factorizations, RBMs maybe, but what people usually don't put, pay much attention to is that the Netflix prize was actually won by ensembles. Um, so the Belcor team, was using a gradient boosted decision tree for uh, making an ensemble from the beginning, and then they added uh, an artificial neural network based ensemble when they joined with uh, Big Chaos. So most practical machine learning applications actually will be using an ensemble. The, the question is why wouldn't you use an ensemble, right? If your predictors are not correlated, you're gonna get at least 
the uh, uh, result is the best of your individual predictors, so wh why wouldn't you try to um, uh, use an ensemble? Uh, not only that, you can combine things w like completely different things like collaborative filtering and content-based uh, recommendations with an ensemble, and that's the easiest way that you can do it. And on top of that, you can use many different models to do, build an ensemble, right? You can use green boosted decision trees or random forest or uh, logistic regression or neural nets. Uh, the other interesting thing about ensembles is that it's the way that you turn a model into a feature. Um, and I mentioned this before. Um, you can build a very complicated model based on deep neural nets, and then you have a prediction, and then that prediction is a feature that then you can use into another model, right? And the easiest way, again, to do this is to use an ensemble. Um, if you don't know whether you want to use factorization machines or tensor factorization, well, why don't use both and then feed it into an ensemble and let the ensemble figure it out? As a matter of fact, um, I tweeted about this and Pedro Domingos, uh, how many people have read The Master Algorithm? It's a pretty new book about machine learning uh, that Pedro Domingos has just published. Uh, the story here is he's trying to find what's the master algorithm of machine learning. What's going to be that algorithm that is going to basically trump them all and do what everything else, in, all the way from sort of like rule-based systems to deep learning can do in a single algorithm. And I tweeted to him, I told him, hey, I'm going to disclose and I'm going to present the master algorithm in, the, in MLConf. And he told me that he was very curious about it. So I'm going to say the master algorithm here is the ensemble. Because the ensemble is the very easiest way to actually combine all of them into a single prediction. It's interesting that the ensemble as an approach to machine learning is not even in the index of this book, which is funny. Um, anyway, uh, number five, uh, the output of your model will be the input of another one and other design problems. Now. Uh, it's great that we can turn any model into a feature, as I said, but the problem is that that's really messy, and it's really messy for your machine learning infrastructure and for your machine learning system. So you start declaring dependencies between models, and you say, okay, the output of my deep learning model that goes into a GBDT does this, and there's a client out there, which is another team or another model that is using it, but now what is the contract between my model and the other one? What if my feature distribution changes what can I do with that? And how do I define that? Um, there's um, not an easy answer to that. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the last year or so, it's been sort of like discussed in the community a lot. So uh, Leon Boutou in the ICML keynote, he talked about two big challenges of machine learning, and one of them was related to this, like how, what, how do we build our machine learning software infrastructure, and how do we build systems that actually can understand these dependencies? So can you treat your machine learning infrastructure as you would treat your software one? Well, I, I think my take on this is yes and no. I mean, you should be able to treat it as your software infrastructure in the sense that um, concepts like encapsulation, abstraction, cohesion, uh, low coupling, those should all apply and you should sort of like target them. But the problem here is there is no really documentation on what are the good design patterns for building those things. Um, I recommend, well, one of the few papers that addresses somewhat, uh, mostly the problems, not so much the solution, just this one that became also very popular, the machine learning, uh, the high interest credit card of technical depth. And as an illustration of um, not having an answer to this problem, uh, there's a Quora question, which I didn't uh, know we had in Quora, but what are the design patterns of machine learning and data mining? And there's no answers there uh, uh, yet. <laughs> Nobody has answered that question. As a matter of fact, it's pretty popular. I don't know, it has like already like 20,000 views of people that are interested in getting the answer, but nobody's answering. Uh, so if there's any sort of like anyone in the audience trying to figure out what's a good PhD topic or a research topic, uh, I think this is a great one because we're all waiting for having a documented list of machine learning, data mining, design patterns. Okay, number six, the pains and gains of feature engineering. So feature engineering at the end is gonna be a lot of what you do in a company uh, in order to make a solution, machine learning solution for your product. 
And as I said, feature engineering is actually could go into building a model and it then is input into another model and becomes a feature. And the four things that I think uh, feature, machine learning features should have in order to be called well-behaved is reusable, transformable, interpretable, and reliable. Reusability means you want to be able to reuse that same feature, that same output of the model or whatever it is, or that query, that have Hive query that produces a feature in as many applications, models, as, and teams even as possible. Uh, transformability means that besides using the exact definition of the feature as it is, you should be able to easily transform it. Things like changing the scale and uh, uh, inputting the log of the feature or the max. But then there's all, other tricky things like you want to be able to describe a feature if it's sort of like number of clicks over different time windows and you want to have sort of like the ability to do that in a way that you're reusing uh, the feature as much as possible. The other two, interpretability, you want to be able to understand what a feature means and that's key to reusability. If you don't understand what it means, how it was implemented, what the, whoever implemented it meant, there's no way that you're going to be able to reuse it. And that goes to the implementation, but also how to interpret the values, the result. And finally, reliability. It should be easy to monitor and detect bugs if the feature breaks, because features do break all the time. And that's uh, a key thing. OK, um, so how do you uh, do feature engineering in the wild, and how do you uh, turn a target or something that you want to optimize for into features. So here, here, I think it's an interesting example. So one of the things we did at Quora not long ago is to come up with an answer ranking algorithm. Uh, given a question, how would you rank the different answers that question got? And in order to rank those questions, we want to rank them according to quality. So forget about relevance for a minute. It's like, how good is the answer to that question? Now, that's a tricky thing, right? Because I don't know how do you find good answer. Um, the good news is we already had the product team at Quora define what a good answer was. As a matter of fact, in the product, if you go to a, the question, what is a good answer according to Quora, you'll get it. Uh, and they, they will talk about things like it needs to be truthful, it needs to be reusable, it needs to provide explanation, it needs to be well formatted, and so on and so forth. So there's a a, key, a few key things that you can underline out of that blog post and you can say, okay, um, now I know what I need to optimize for uh, and now I know what kind of features I need to have in my model so it can learn these things because otherwise it couldn't learn uh, these things. So how do we translate those into features? So we do things like we use features that relate to the text quality itself because we want to understand the quality and whether it's well formatted and whatever they were telling us was good quality. We're going to have interaction features, like did people actually uh, upboard or downboard, so is it a trustworthy uh, answer or not? But not only uh, we're going to take into account those things about the answer itself, we're going to use it from the users, and we're going to know whether the user itself, himself or herself, was actually uh, is trustworthy and we can trust what they're writing or not. And then we feed all of that into our model as features, and those are the different dimensions the model is going to be learning, and it's going to be learning, again, according to the training data and what we define as the target function as a good question. Okay, number seven, and I got to move on because I'm, I want to make sure I finish on time. The two phases of your machine learning infrastructure. So, again, something that comes up over and over, and I'm not sure we talk about it very often, um, when you're building any sort of machine learning system infrastructure, there are two things that you need to worry about, the, or two modes. Um, the first one is machine learning experimentation, right? You want something that people, they're experimenting, they're uh, playing around with different features, different models, have flexibility, easy, it's easy to use, and uh, it's reusable. But then there's a second mode, which is like, okay, machine learning production. And now in machine learning production, you may want all the above, but then now you're adding a couple of constraints here. It needs to be performant and it needs to be scalable. Now, you don't want those two things, two modes, to be two separate infrastructures because that's complicated and you need to maintain two different things and there's a handoff in between. So you want that to be as close as possible. Now, how, you, how do you do that? Um, okay, you could go to these two options. Like one is favor experimentation and have 
a ton of things that support experimentation, and then only in, invest in productionizing things that have success, and then hand off something that to some other team, like you have machine le learning researchers using R, and then ask somebody else, engineers, to implement things in production when they work. Option two, which would be the other way around, is you favor production, and you have highly uh, efficient things implemented in C++, and then you have researchers struggle finding things in the database and logs and trying to come up with the ne next big thing. Um, I think none of this actually works, and you need to go uh, to intermediate options. So what are some intermediate options? So you could have uh, machine learning re researchers experiment, for example, using an interface like IPython no notebooks and use, using Python tools, uh, scikit-learn, Theano, and so on, and then use the same tools in production whenever possible, and it is possible to use these tools in production, and only implement optimized versions when really needed, which it's not going to be all the time. Um, and the other way around, which is another good intermediate option, is you have optimized things running in production, and you offer abstraction layers or APIs or ways to interface with those, th those things that are in production that then can offer this accessibility to researchers. Okay, number eight, why you should care about answering questions, and I'm not talking about answering questions in Quora here, I'm talking about answering questions about your model. And uh, the key thing here is model debuggability, right? Uh, the value of a model uh, when you implement it in a product is the value that it brings to the product. But you're gonna have, if you're lucky and that works and your company works, you're gonna have a bunch of product owners and stakeholders that have expectations on how that product is behaving and what your model is bringing into, that, into it. So it is important to answer questions about how things work, but more importantly, why did things fail, right? So if somebody goes to their Quora feed and all of a sudden they get an answer that it's really poor quality and they don't care about, and it's like, what is this doing in my feed? How did we get this here? So it is important to understand and to be able to give an answer to that. And model debuggability is so important that sometimes it actually can determine the mm, particular model you're gonna use, the features you're gonna rely on, or the implementation of the tools. Uh, so the first uh, screenshot here is from uh, BigML. BigML is a company that has this pretty cool sort of like debuggability tool for uh, decision trees. Um, and you can get sort of like all the nodes highlighted and how is the decision being made and you can actually answer this kind of questions. The other one is about TensorFlow, which we all heard that it's not very efficient, but it does has, have a pretty cool sort of like flow interface that you can at least understand better how the things you're putting together, how they're going into the system. Um, an example from Quora, uh, we have a pretty detailed debuggability tool for the example that I gave you for feed. Uh, so given an answer or a question that you have in feed, you, we can actually, for a given user, we can actually say not only what are the different features that are being used in the model to determine the position of that feed, we can actually compare it uh, pairwise to other features and say, hey, if I exchange this particular, to, to other answers, sorry, if I exchange the features into these two answers, how would the ranking change? And what does this mean? And what is it make, what's making this answer either not appear or appear in the feed? And that's something that we use on a daily basis to sort of like feed into how our model is doing better or worse or whether there's even a bug in some feature that we have implemented. Okay, number nine, and maybe one of the most controversial ones, trust me, you don't need to distribute your ML algorithm. And I know there are people in the room that uh, will get mad at me for saying this. Um, so, um, we actually, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the last presentation that I, uh, Give here, I was talking about distributing machine learning algorithms at, at different levels, and it is true that some things you need to distribute, but the reality is that most of the time, if you are smart about the problem you're solving, and you're smart about data sampling, you're smart about deciding what you do offline and what you do online, and more than anything, you're smart about how you implement your code in a single machine. As Alex was saying before, like all everything you do in a single machine, multi-core machine, is that gonna, then going to be useful if you ever need to distribute your approach. Um, that's 
all drives to this conclusion that most of the time, unless you have a large scale distributed deep uh, neural net uh, searching for cats in Google, um, it's unlikely that you're going to need to distribute your algorithm. Um, as a matter of fact, easy distributed approaches such as Hadoop and Spark, it's kind of, they're kind of evil um, because they incentivize this model where you don't care about cost and you don't care, well, I don't know, I just you know, launched some MapReduce jobs. It took whatever it took, whatever number of machines there were available in the cluster, which I don't know about because it's paid by somebody else. Um, and I think that's uh, really hurting us, and we need to sort of like go back to understanding how we can optimize those algorithms. Here's an interesting example from Quora. So we had a Spark implementation of uh, an algorithm that took six hours over 15 machines. At some point, we thought, like, That's, that doesn't make any sense. We should be able to do this much faster. So what we did is we had an engineer for four days look into it. And he actually looked into the scheduling, what Spark was uh, unfolding, what was it doing, and said, OK, I'm going to implement this in C++. And after four days, the C++ implementation um, runs in one machine and takes 10 minutes. So as you can see, the use of the four days of engineering time were really, really worth it, even if you don't care about giving all your money away to Amazon. So my point is like many things that you're doing in a distributed fashion and they're incentivizing this mode, you're m much likely to get value out of it by hiring an engineer like this one and say, okay, can you implement something efficient and then offer an API or whatever to access and to favor the experimentation that we're gonna need because of course, that's the trade-off you're making, right? It might be less flexible if you implement it in hardcore, sort of like low-level C. Okay, um, number 10, also maybe a little controversial, is the untold story of data science and machine learning engineering. There's a lot of discussion in different organizations, like how do you structure those teams? How do you combine them? How do you make this work? We all know what a data scientist is, and there's like a ton of definitions and a ton, uh, a ton of very cool diagrams telling you, you know, how a data scientist has hacking skills and math and statistics and um, domain expertise. Um, but the question I'm trying to answer here is not not who is what is a data scientist. Like, okay, I know what a data scientist is. How do I fit this into my organization? How do I make it work? Um, first thing, though, I have to say. Uh, strong data scientists with solid engineering skills are unicorns, and that doesn't mean they cost over a billion dollars, but uh, <laughs> they're around that value. Um, but um, it's really hard to find sort of like a very solid data scientist with math, statistics, uh, PhD skills, and also like a hacker and super good coder. And Honestly, if you're going to build an organization based on finding those people, uh, uh, the answer is like, it's really hard to scale, right? Um, so what's my answer to how do you solve this and how do you think about uh, teaming up sort of data science and machine learning in an organization? So if we think about the machine learning innovation funnel and what you do in a project in order to sort of bring machine learning solution, data-driven machine learning solution into your product, there are basically three phases. The first one is data research. Data research means we don't even know what the heck we're gonna be optimizing in the product. We just know it could work better and we need to look at the data and analyze what it's doing and try to figure out are the users clicking here? Are the users clicking there? Are they clicking here when they're tired and clicking there when it's uh, 7 a.m.? Or what is going on and how can we even build a hypothesis around like what we need to solve? The second phase of the funnel is we know what we need to solve, now we're gonna implement it. We're gonna do machine learning exploration, we're gonna build different models, we know what, we, uh, what features we can use, and when we're gonna implement that as a solution in the product. And then the third one, which is also very important, is like, okay, we've tried to solve the, uh, and validate the hypothesis that we had at the beginning with a solution, now let's test it. Let's do an A-B test, let's run the test, let's analyze the data, and let's figure out what it means, did we solve or do we need to go back? Um, first of all, I wanna say this might look a little bit like a waterfall scheme, but it's not. I'm not saying you need to do these things and each one of them takes two months. This could be sort of like a couple of days each and it could sort of like be a completely iterative, agile approach. Um, so the solution here is to hand off 
each of the different parts of the funnel to a different team. And for me, uh, from what I've seen and what I've experienced, I think the part one and part three are better driven by data scientists. So the data research exploration phase is better built and led by data science organization. The number three, the online experimentation, A-B testing, is also better led by a data science organization. But the second one, the machine learning solution, building that into the product, is better led by an engineering organization. Now, going back to what I was saying before, I'm not saying the second phase doesn't have or can have data scientists. As a matter of fact, data scientist is a label that anyone can put to themselves, whether they have sort of like a little bit of math or they have uh, a lot of math and a little bit of um, software engineering skills. The point that I'm trying to make again, going back to the organization, is what part of the organization or what should be the different uh, decision-making skills that should come into play in the different phases. And uh, I think the second one should belong to um, engineering and the first and the third one to data science. And I'm happy to discuss this over a coffee if people have better ideas. Um, so I think I'm, yeah, uh, a, a little bit, 30 seconds over time. Um, I'm gonna go into conclusions. So if I take the 10 lessons to sort of like try to find a couple of themes, one would be make sure you teach your model what you wanted to learn. Second one, ensembles and the combination of supervised and supervised techniques are key in many if, no, if not most machine learning applications. It is important to focus on feature engineering and last, uh, you need to be thoughtful about your machine learning infrastructure and tools, and also about how you organize your teams. So thank you very much.